in my life has been, uh, I've had a lot of different jobs and was in college for 10 years, just kind of searching and searching and questioning and, and going from discipline over here to discipline. And this isn't it, this isn't it, this isn't it. <laughs> like, and, and ultimately, the, the good news of the Course is that this world isn't it. I mean, that there we do have a higher calling inside. It is calling us upward and onward to a very bossy function. Uh, healing, or um, is the way it's talked about early in the text, uh, healing is the vocation of the mind. So we, it's like when we kind of get caught in these self-concepts and we kind of get caught in, well, I have to do this and this and this and this, beneath it is there that we are to be healing. Whether you think of it as being a healer or if you bring it back to the course this way of looking at things that, that really you're just healing your own mind. So sometimes it's a little uncomfortable to think of some of those old images of going out and laying hands on people or whatever. That seems like a pretty wild idea too that's not very acceptable sometimes to some of us. And ultimately, um, you were talking about these thoughts that keep coming back and it seems like they keep coming and coming and coming. Um, one way we could come at it is I call it backwards thinking and forward thinking. When we discussed it at uh, Rhonda's house the other day, that, that the Course keeps teaching us, like a lot of spiritual paths, that, that we need to take self-responsibility for our state of mind, complete self-responsibility, that there is nothing outside of us in the world, including conditions of our body or conditions um, in the world in innumerable ways, that have the power to take away our peace of mind. But the ego belief system is no, you are small, you are teeny, you are a pawn, you are a victim of the circumstances in the world. It could be job situations, could be you could feel like it in a relationship, in a sense where it's like a codependency, and you feel like you're you're sunk in. It could be with friendships, where you feel like um, your friends are very important to you and maybe be the center of your life and therefore their opinions um, seem to dominate your state of mind, you know, what they think and everything. Some people call it people pleasing, you know, where you're, it's like you take your state of mind and say, here it is on a silver platter, <laughs> be careful with it now, you know, and, and in the ultimate sense, that's a, that's a big setup for being a victim as well, because we, the Course teaches us we're completely responsible for our state of mind. And we might think of the mind when it's in the deceived state, it's just filled with these backward thoughts, these thoughts of that there's certain things that can happen to us and can hurt us on the outside. Um, a lot of times in jobs, you know, there's a fear of being fired. And, you know, sometimes you'll you'll be in a job and issues will come up where you don't feel it just doesn't feel right, ethically or morally, and, and yet it comes down to, well, you know, you do it because your boss says to, to do it. Or you do it because the government says to do it or something. There's some kind of an outside authority. And the Course is, is bringing it up uh, full circle to say that when we line our minds up with the will of God, then we'll be perfectly happy and perfectly joyful. And we are sustained literally by the love of our Father. That, that there is no external authority then that we bow down to. You know, It's kind of tough to put some of these ideas together when you when you keep being told that you're the Holy Son of God, you know, and magnificent and everything, and then you you feel like you're this person that's got to, you know, bow down here and there and conform to the ways of the world, to the ways of work, to relationship situations. It's kind of like, how can I be both? How can I be this sense of magnitude and, and then turn right around and, and feel so teeny and feel like I'm at the demands of everything else? And... What the Course is saying is that the world that we perceive, the deceived mind perceives, is a, is a projection and is a construction that was made to hide from that true identity, from the love of God. It's kind of like I used the old story about, um, I think it's around in the 500s where there's the phrase in the Course, into eternity where all this one, there crept a tiny man idea in which the Son of God remembered not to let. And kind of if you can imagine, there's this mighty, powerful, powerful mind, the Son of God, and this tiny little puff, like one of those little seeds we saw blowing on the way over, the little white puff that blow across the road or 
something like a piece of pollen or something blowing along in this magnificent, powerful mind that, that is everything and that has everything, that's in perfect love and harmony with the Father, and kind of taking this powerful mind and focusing it on this tiny little pup, kind of turning it towards this pup and, and going, hmm, kind of I wonder if, you know, there could be more than all of this, you know, or um, kind of another way to look at it is the, the father and son are one, and they're an eternal band, and they're like each other in every way. They're spirit, eternal, light, and abstract, and there's only one difference in this oneness. There's only one thing that even, you can't even tell the difference in heaven between the father and son, because it's like this ongoing song, and there's no interruption, and there's no way to see where one ends and one begins. But there is one difference in a functional sense, in that the Father created the Son. The Son of God did not create the Father. Well, it's almost like this little pup said, are you going to settle for that? Are you, you going to settle for being the created? You know, what if you could be number one, kingpin? Make up a world kind of on your own and, and not, you know, even though it's an eternal list, it's kind of like, what if you could be the creator? What if you could have things your own way? Whatever you wanted to do it. Right? You know? And a lot of us are familiar with that voice inside our minds, you know, I, I want to do it my way, and I want to have it you know, just the way I want. So, metaphorically, in our little story here, when the Son of God seemed to, to give his mind to this puff, it was a very horrifying kind of experience. And that's when projection was made, um, the Big Bang, so to speak, I call it the Big Bang in the mind, instead of the Big Bang where the stars were scattered, it's like literally the Big Bang in the mind. And, and the projection of the world was like a giant screen to, in which the ego said, quick, make up a world of form, because you know, God's abstract and like, you can't, he won't come into form and get you. So basically, what we see is that the split in the mind then gets projected out onto a split world, and now a world of duality, of male, female, hot, cold, fast, slow, you know, high, low, all these, a world of duality is held out there in place, and the mind, we also should say victim, victimizer, when particularly if you're working on not judging someone, I mean, the key to not judging is to not, to not see anybody as one or the other of those things. This to just not reinforce that what is being outside. So, if we bring it back to uh, a job situation, basically now in, in the dream world, the ego teaches that, you know, you're a body, you're tiny. Um, anybody heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs? You got, you got needs here. You've got the lower order needs. You've got to, you've got to keep your body warm. You've got to keep, you know, enough food in it you got to drink and, you know, the lower order needs and then so on and so forth. But these are established as, as the way it is. That's just the way it is. Now, everybody, the laws of survival, you know. And, and, and that's the basis of the laws of survival, of course, is, is the belief in scarcity. The belief in the mind that I'm lacking. Because not enough food, not enough clothing, not enough shelter, basically all have their underpinnings in the belief in scarcity or lack, which, it, which still is the ego. So, you know, over the millennium, people have done different ways to seeming survive and, and so on and so forth, and jobs to be one of them. And here comes the Course of Miracles, and it's saying, now, we, we want to turn around the thoughts from you being at the victim of outside forces. And it's going to take faith and trust, because obviously, if you start laying aside the ways of the world, the things that you think you have to do, you know, to make it. You've got to have something to take the place of that. You know, it's like the lilies of the field, you know, passages in the Bible <laughs> for, the, for the apostles back then. You've got to have something that's going to kick in, that's going to carry you through and carry you home, so to speak. And, and this something, of course, completely is the opposite, or it's completely the opposite of the ways of the world, which rely on external circumstances, you know, huge, not only food, clothing, shelter, but then you get into insurance, you got to have enough insurance, you know, and that whole thing about protecting the 
things that you own. And it's kind of like a like a, a tightly wound um, spring with all, all these defenses, you know, that are in there. And to start laying aside defenses, you have to have something, a rock that you can put your faith in. Because what would it make any sense to start to give up some of this stuff and move in the other direction, you know, unless you had something there. So, you know, for me, my life has been a series of of questioning um, the nature of reality, questioning everything. Even when I was in college, when I was in you know different degree programs, I instead of just being a good student and taking all the courses that I was supposed to take and and trying to be polished off to be whatever, an urban planner with one degree, or I was an engineering for a while, I was in psychology for a while, to be a good school psychologist or whatever. I'm going in there and I'm questioning the underpinnings or questioning the um, bases in which the things I'm in are about. In other words, a lot of times you do that when you look for a job. You know, maybe you don't want a job in the defense industry. <laughs> if making bombs or something is something that you don't feel real congruent with. I was doing the same thing with all of my studies. You know, like school psychology, for instance, it has IQ testing and tracking and there's lots of things that was just did not resonate, you know, with, with pigeonholing people according to certain tests. And, and the more I, I, I gave the test and the more I, I looked at the, the questions of the test, and it was like, well, you know, this is all judgment. It's all evaluation. You know, it was all, yeah. <laughs> but it just didn't feel congruent with the core of my being. And so just like, you know, urban planning was a very future-oriented program, and I, I had to analyze all these factors and project ahead for, you know, planning or traffic control and all these things. But once again, it was that same thing. It just didn't resonate. You know, it was so off in the future. And and I was more and more moving in the direction of, of spontaneity, of trying to listen to my intuition and trust and make decisions that way. So, you know, a lot of times job experiences, um, it's the same thing in the sense that, that it's just a construct, and it's basically um, we be what we believe is our picture there. And so as I started to shift my mind about my concepts about myself, then I started to seem to get jobs that, that were a little more loose, and I seemed to have a little more freedom, and I seemed to be able to take a little more responsibility in each job. And this kind of continued on and on and on until the last formal job that I had, I was mentioning the other day, at, at Rhonda's was uh, teaching a, a four-hour psychology class where I had free reign basically to do whatever I wanted to do. I, I didn't have any kind of curriculum constraints. I was able to pick, you know, the text I wanted, use the materials I wanted, show movies in class, um, you know, use, do experiential exercises. And it was in an art institute, and the director basically just gave me free reign and, and didn't even hop in and sit in on class to see what I was doing. And so I thought, Okay, spirit, <laughs> let's go here. <laughs> it wasn't like any job that I'd ever had before. A long sequence of jobs, but each one seemed to be a little more, I was able to do a little more. And it was like, what the Course teaches is that as we change our mind, automatically the situations will, will seem to outpicture uh, more of this fluidity and, and more um, less rigidity and structure and so on and so forth. And that's good news for us because once again, you know, as you're working with the course and everything, sometimes it can be like, how is this ever going to relate to my job? You know, it's like the mind tries to say, course in miracles, job, oh boy. <laughs> kind of like, these two are not ever going to come together. Or one time I they asked somebody who's channeling one of the people that they channel, you know, you know, how how am I going to become enlightened and still stay at the corporation? And the being said, you won't be as a corporation <laughs> when you're enlightened. <laughs> kind of, you know, one of these things that don't try to project ahead and project what it looks like now and fit it in with, with enlightenment. I think another great example of that was, um, for me, Krishnamurti was a spiritual man who taught for like 60 or 70 years all over on different continents in the globe. And, and um, it was kind of like he didn't belong to anything. I mean, you know, he'd say, well, what about a group of friends? Well, you know, he, he seemed to be 
there was people that was kind of